Resourceful Designer, Episode 15, 50 Questions to Ask Before Every New Design Project. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host. He once halted a press run when he saw an error on a Celine Dion album, Mark Decoat. Welcome to Resourceful Designer. Thank you for joining me today. I'm always thrilled to have you listening along as I discuss graphic design. Now, I do want to clear something up about that intro. I never did any work for Celine Dion, but I did, in fact, halt a press run of one of her CDs. And I'll just give you the brief story. When I was working at the printer, as well as a graphic designer, I was also had the title of systems manager, which meant I was in charge of all the computers and a lot of the equipment in the shop. And we were in the process of purchasing a new CTP machine, which is a computer to plate machine. So when we were designing stuff, we used to output film and then that film was used to burn printing plates. Well, we were going to upgrade our system to a machine where we can output directly from the computer to the printing plate, bypassing the film. And in essence, it would create a much cleaner print job because you had one less step to degrade the image. Well, in the process, we were looking at various different machines And I went for a tour in Montreal, Quebec of a big printing company that had one of the machines we were looking at. So it was myself, the salesman from the the company whose machine we were looking to buy, as well as a couple of representatives from that printing shop showing us around. And when they were showing us the room where the, the machine was installed, they had a couple of plates sitting on top of the machine. And they gave me a, well, we call them a loop, but it's in essence, it's a magnifying glass for me to examine how crisp and clear the dots on the plate are. And this just so happened to be a printing plate for one of Celine Dion's CDs, which they were printing for her. And as they were talking, I was using the loop and I was looking at the image on the plate and I came across a line. I forget exactly what the line read, but I did know that the word there was in it and whoever had done it did not use the proper form of there I don't remember if it was T-H-E-R-E and it should have been one of the others or or whatever. All I knew is when I read it, I realized right away that it was the wrong word. And I just made an off comment, kind of jokingly saying, oh, well, I know why these plates are here and not on the printing press. I said, somebody must have caught the spelling mistake. And all of a sudden, the guys that were talking, the, the salesmen and the representatives of the shop, everybody went quiet and they says, what do you mean? And I says, well, right here, this is not the right word. And anyways, panic broke out. One of the guys opened up a door, pressed this big red button, a siren went off, and they started yelling, stop the press, because what it turned out to be is these printing plates were actually backup plates. The job was on the web press being printed as we were looking at the machine. And the plates there, which they left on the machine for me to look at, were actually the plates to continue the run, because the plates are good for a certain amount of, of impressions, and then you have to replace them. Well, this was the next set of plates that would be used once they had printed, I don't know if it was like a half million or whatever, and then they swapped the plates. I forget the actual number. But they put a halt on it, and I don't know how many of them they had actually printed that were wrong and that they had to scrap, because later, whenever the CD was finally released, and I managed to get a hold of one of them to see the insert, I noticed that the error had been corrected. So because of me, somebody yelled, stop the presses, and they had to pull a Celine Dion CD insert off and get it redone. So that's the story behind the intro to this episode. So now, as always, I'd like to start off the episode with a resource of the week. And this week's resource is PDF Pen and also PDF Pen Pro. Now, PDF Pen is a Mac-only software. Sorry to all you Windows users out there. But PDF Pen makes it extremely easy to fix, change, alter, fill out anything to do with PDFs. Now, if you've ever had to work with a PDF, a pre-existing PDF, you know sometimes how difficult it can be. You, If you have Acrobat, some sort of professional version of Acrobat, sometimes you can do it, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. In the past, I know I've had to bring PDFs into Adobe Illustrator to fix them. Well, now PDF Pen, which I just started using a few months ago, makes it so easy to fix and to alter, to move stuff around. If there's some sort of form you receive and it wasn't built as a PDF form for you to fill out, you can use PDF Pen to fill it out on your own and insert your signature and all sorts of stuff. So that's what I chose as the resource this week, PDF Pen. And to find out more about PDF Pen, 
you can visit smilesoftware.com. Now, I'm not affiliate with them. I don't get anything for recommending them. It's just software that I started using a few months ago, and I really like it. It's now my go-to program anytime I have to do anything with PDFs other than just reading them. So there you have it. Now, I know in the past I've asked you if you've been enjoying this podcast to please leave me a review in iTunes, which I still would really appreciate. But even more so, if you are enjoying this podcast, please share it with fellow designers. Let them know about it. Send them the link. You can send them directly to resourcefuldesigner.com or tell them to look it up on iTunes. If they want to subscribe on iTunes, you can go directly to resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes and they could subscribe right there. But that's the best sort of appreciation you can give me is just passing on this podcast and letting another designer know about it. Now, in this week's episode, I'm going to discuss 50 questions to ask before you take on any new design project. And if you're looking for a list of these questions or for any other links or anything mentioned in this episode, you could find them in the show notes at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 15. And without further ado, let's get right into the meat of this episode. Now, one thing that sets us as graphic designers apart from those, I'll call them contest sites, stuff like 99designs or, or whatever the other ones are, where people go and place a bid for a logo and then a whole bunch of people compete and then the person can choose which one they like best. And what makes us different than those sort of things is the fact that we get to have a communication with the client. Most of those other sites, the client will put something out, they'll write down what they want, and then these designers just design it without knowing anything, without doing any research, without it knowing any background behind what the purpose of this logo is or, or whatever design happens to be. And that's why sometimes those designs and logos or whatever the people are trying to get are very basic in nature. And although some of them can be very, I can say, pretty, When it comes to design, they're not really well thought out. And how could you? Because you really don't know the full scope of what you're designing. And that's what makes us stand out is our ability to ask questions of our potential clients and and basically equip ourselves so that we go into a project fully prepared. To use a sports analogy here, a best defense is often a good offense. And that's what we do when, before we even take on a job, we ask a bunch of questions to know more. Now, the other benefit of asking questions is that it shows that you are a professional. Guaranteed, you're going to ask questions that your client might not think of themselves. And by doing so, it inspires confidence in them that you are the right person for the job. Sometimes so much so that they are willing to overlook your cost if you maybe we're not the lowest bidder on a project and this isn't one of those projects where they have to go with the lowest bidder. But if they were getting a few quotes, but if somebody else, if they just said, say a logo, for example, I need a logo for a certain product we're creating and somebody just said, okay, here's my price. But then you come back and you ask all these questions and then you come back with a higher price. They might look at the other one and say, well, that person gave us a price, but they didn't ask us anything. This person here who asked all these questions really seems to know what they're doing. They really, they're taking the time to get to know us and everything before they even submit a price. Even though their price is higher, I want to deal with this person. So the question asking process is actually multifold what it does for you. Not only do you gain the knowledge that you need to create a good design, as I said, it also instills the confidence that you are a professional and that you know what you're doing. And it puts your clients at ease and more willing to work with you. Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to give you 50 questions here, and you are not to ask all of them. These are way too many questions to ask your clients, but you need to pick and choose which ones of these are important for the project you're talking about. And who knows, in the process, you may come up with questions that are not on this list, stuff that you think up on your own as you're having a conversation with your client. Just remember that no design project ever failed because the designer knew too much about the client they're working for. So you're best to ask these questions, get the answers, then to go into the project naive and not knowing and possibly wasting your time and your client's time designing something that isn't what they want. Now I've divided these questions into different categories. First, I'm going to talk about the questions to ask about the company in general, then questions to ask about your client's target audience then questions to ask about the brand, 
then questions to ask about their design preferences, and finally, questions to ask about the scale and time frame and budget of the job. Now, just to make this easier for the podcast, I will be referring to the client as a company, but the same questions apply whether it's an organization, a group, an individual person, the same sort of thing applies. But instead of referring them to them as the company slash organization slash service or whatever, I'm just going to refer to them as the company. But you interchange whatever works for you. So in the first group of questions, these are questions you need to ask. And these are usually the first questions you will ask. And these are about your client's company. Now, the first one right off the bat is, what's the name of your company? Now, this is especially important if you're designing a logo for them, obviously. But sometimes this project might not necessarily be a logo. It could be anything. Maybe they want to design a new website. Maybe they want to design a brochure. Maybe it's an ad to go in a magazine or or who knows, a t-shirt, a trade show booth. It could be just about anything. But right off the bat, you need to know what the name of the company is. So that one's a given. And then you go into a little bit more detail. And you should ask your client to describe what their company does. Because sometimes the name doesn't actually tell you that. And you can't always just take it for granted. I have two clients that are lawyers. And both of them have the name something something law firm. Well, that's good. I know that my clients are lawyers. But one of my clients only deals with real estate law. And the other client doesn't touch real estate law. They do business law and civil law. And they have a couple of lawyers at their place that cover different things. But they don't do real estate law. And as I said, the other one only does real estate law. So by asking, what does your company do? I was able to differentiate and know that when I was working with one client who only deals with real estate, I had a certain focus I can follow when designing for them, just like that focus would be different for the other law firm. So ask your client to describe what their company does. Now, question number three might not always apply, but that's ask your client what services or products their company produces. So in some cases, you might not be designing something for one of their service or their products, but just knowing what they do can help you in establishing what sort of company this is. I mean, maybe the company produces shovels, but they're hiring you to do a promotional ad for a local magazine just showing how they give back to the community. Well, the ad has nothing to do with the shovels they produce, but knowing the company makes shovels, maybe that will influence your design. Now, question number four is, how long have you been in business? Now, this is important because some companies might have some sort of history behind them. And that's something you want to know. Is this a company that's only been around for six months and maybe doesn't have a lot of brand awareness? Or is this a company that's been around for 50 years and people know about it? That sort of thing will affect the way you design for them. Now, question number five, along the same lines, is why was this company started? Now, if you're working for this CEO or the owner, or whoever started the movement, or the club, or whatever it is, then it's a lot easier to get an answer for this. Like sometimes there's a really interesting story behind why a company was started. If you're doing work for a restaurant, is it just that the person liked cooking food and decided to open a restaurant? Or did they open a restaurant here because their parents ran a restaurant back in their native country or whatever, and they've moved now here and they want to continue the tradition? So why the company was started is a very important question. Now, question number six is how big is the company? Is this just a one-man operation or are there a hundred employees? This sort of thing will make a difference in your design. Number seven is are you a local company, a national company, an international company? You know, that could make a big difference in how you're designing something. If I'm designing for a Canadian company and they don't deal with anything outside of Canada, then I know that some of my designs can be more influenced by the Canadian culture. But if it's a company that's in Canada but does a lot of dealing in the U.S., they might not want some of that Canadian culture in their design because they're trying to attract a U.S. market or an overseas market. Now, question number eight about the company is, who is your competition? Now, this is an important question to ask and one you shouldn't leave out. And this applies whether it's a company, an organization, a service group, or whatever, is who is your competition? And moving right along to question number nine is, how are you different from your competition? Now, this is the one that can really help you sometimes if your client can pinpoint exactly what makes them different from their competition. Is it their service? Is it their quality? Is it their customer satisfaction? 
All these little things can help you in your design and maybe lead you in one direction or the other. Now, following in line with this same thought, question number 10 is, how are your competitors marketing themselves? And this is a very important question, depending on the project that you're being hired for. If you're being brought in to design a logo, then yes, you'll want to look at the competition, see what they have. So you don't design something that's along the similar lines and looks like it's copying them. But if you're being brought in to help market a company and not specifically for uh, a certain project, like they want a web banner or a logo or, or something, if they're bringing you on to create an entire marketing campaign, well, then you'll want to know what the competitors are doing because who knows, if they're a well-established competitor, they might have done a lot of the market research that you need to do and have figured some stuff out. Maybe they know that direct mail marketing isn't working in that area. Or maybe you notice that the competitors are constantly putting billboards up and are getting a lot of traffic from them. So knowing how the competitors market themselves can be very beneficial in your design. Now, continuing on with questions about the company, number 11 What are the long-term goals for the company? Now, this one might not be asked in every project, but if you're doing a design for a specific conference that's coming up and it's a one-time conference and that's it. But if this is something like the company starting this conference and they're hoping to make this a national event or an international event and go on for years and years, you might want to know what these long-term goals are. Or if it's a startup company and they're developing one product, it would be good to know up front that they have other plans to develop other products so that you don't focus all your design on that one product. And to round out this section about the company, two questions that are related, and that's question number 12, can you describe your company's strength? And question number 13, can you describe your company's weaknesses? Again, both very important questions, and these are mostly to kind of get a feel for the company. If you can talk to the owner or the manager and they can tell you what the strengths of their company are, they might give you something that might trigger something creatively in you. If one of the company's strengths is client retention or client loyalty, maybe that's something you can tie into the design. And if your client can describe some of their weaknesses, maybe you can design something that'll draw away from that so that people don't focus on those weaknesses. So that rounds out section number one with questions you should ask about the company. And I'll run over those real quick one more time. Question number one, what is the name of the company? Two, can you describe what your company does? Three, what services or product does your company produce? Four, how long have you been in business? Five, why did you start this company? Six, how big is the company? Seven, are you local, national, or international? Eight, who's your competition? Nine, how are you different from your competition? 10, how are your competitors marketing themselves? 11, what are your long-term goals for the company? 12, can you describe your company's strength? And finally, 13, can you describe your company's weaknesses? Now, moving on to the next section, here are questions about the target audience that you should be asking before taking on any design project. Now, question number one in this section is, can you identify and describe your target audience. And you'd be amazed at how many clients or how many people can't actually do this. This should be a prerequisite in any business is determining your target audience. But I I have dealt with so many clients over the years that when I ask them this question, they'll just say, well, everybody's my target audience. I'll sell to everybody. Yes, we understand that. You will sell to everybody. You're not going to turn somebody away because they're not part of your target audience But you should still have, or they should still have, a target audience in sight in order to focus your design on. And that includes age, gender, social class, location, and so many other things. Maybe they sell to everybody, but the majority of their clients are women. Well, that will influence the design you're doing. And when you ask about age, maybe they'll say, well, early 20s, 30s, or that. But then they'll say something like, But these are women who don't have kids yet, maybe. Well, there you go. That narrows something down again. Knowing they target women in the business sector will also influence your design. So anything they can give you, whether they realize they have a target audience or not, this is part of your job as a designer, is to get some sort of information out of them. And again, they might say, well, everybody is my audience. Everybody, I want to sell to them all. They're all my target audience. You can agree with them and say, yes, you'll sell to everybody. But let's try to narrow it down a bit. And it'll help really focus. And you have to explain to them that just because you narrow it down, that you're looking at, say, 
business women in their early 30s, late 20s who live in a certain location, that doesn't mean that they won't attract men or women that are older or younger or anybody else. It's just, it's easier to create a design whenever you've got a target audience chosen. Now, if the client comes back and says, yes, they know who their target audience is, then you move on to question number two here, which is, are you focusing just on this target market or are you trying to hit other markets as well? So I've had cases in the past where I've had a client that's come in and said, yes, I know exactly who my target market is, but they were alienating everybody outside that market. And that wasn't always a good thing. Yes, they were extremely focused on that one market, but sometimes you do get some spillover from other markets and you want to make sure that whatever you use, the wording, the images, the design overall, doesn't push away people that are outside the target market. Now, question number three in this section is to ask your client, how do they think their target audience describes their company? Now, this is always an interesting one because sometimes they'll, they won't know or maybe they will. Maybe they have testimonials from their clients or from their target audience. And that's great stuff. If you can get a hold of some of those testimonials, that will go a long way into helping you know how their target audience views the company. Now, question number four is, How is their target audience currently discovering the company? Is it mostly word of mouth? Are they using radio and television ads? Are they doing any sort of other promotional thing in order to gain awareness? So how is their target audience discovering the company? And finally, last question, number five in this section, is how are you currently connecting with your target audience? Is the company actively using social media to connect with their clients? Do they have a mailing list where they can reach out? Whatever answer they can give you here can be very beneficial to your whole design process. So those are the five questions I have about the target audience of your client. And those questions, once again, number one, can you identify and describe your target audience and go into age, gender, social class, location, etc.? Number two, are you focusing just on this market or are you trying to hit other markets as well? Number three, How do you think your target audience describes your company? Number four, how does your target audience currently discover your company? And number five, how do you connect with your target audience? Now moving on to the next section, and this is about the brand that the company already has or is trying to develop. And this is the one that that really gets into the detail because this information is really going to be considered whenever you do your design. Now, the first question I ask of any client is, do they have a specific color palette in mind? Sometimes the company will already have a color palette established, but some of them don't. It's amazing. Other than their logo, they don't have a color palette for the rest of their marketing material. And depending, like some clients, if they have a single, they have a blue logo. They only have a single color logo that's blue. And they don't know what to do. They think everything has to be blue. And and this is where you have to discover if they already have something, because maybe they have blue, but they're going to have a lot of complementary colors or or stuff already established or nothing. And is this something that you are going to establish for them? So that's one of the first questions I always ask. Number two is, are there any design elements associated with your company or brand? So if this is an established company, is there anything? Do they use certain fonts in all? everything they do to keep consistent other than their logos are there any icons or images or anything that they use consistently that are associated with the company i know it's kind of corny but there was a local restaurant in the city i grew up in called bobby's place and bobby was the son of the owner and all his marking material everything he put out had the school photo of his son bobby and every year that he got a new school photo He redid all his marketing material so that it was always current with the most recent school photo of his son. So that's something to know. If, say, he came to hire me to do a design for him, I would have to know this sort of thing. Yes, he had a logo for Bobby's Place, but I would have also had to be told that a certain photo had to appear on all design elements. And sometimes it's a font, not just the font that's in the logo, but maybe all the body copy on everything or all the heading copy on everything they do, including their website, uses a certain font. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, we don't use anything that's serif or we don't use any sans serifs. That's all questions you need to know. So any design elements. Now, question number three is, does the company have a mission statement? 
And sometimes a mission statement can really tell a lot about a company. Now, not every company does have a mission statement. So this is one depending. And obviously, if it's not a company, if it's some sort of organization or social group or event, maybe there won't be a mission statement involved. But it's a good question just to find out a little bit more and gain some insight on the company. Now, number four is a crucial question, and that's what current and past marketing material have you used? If this is an already established company, now obviously you're not going to use this question if this is a startup that's coming to you, but if this is an established company, you want to know what sort of marketing material they've already used in the past, because if they're coming for something new, something fresh, you obviously don't want to use something from before. But in the same case, maybe you want to tie stuff into their old designs, like you can completely do a refresh, but still tie in some small elements from their old design so that people viewing it will still associate it with the same company. I do all the marketing material for local Highland games. And before I took them on as a client, and this is going back almost 10 years ago, everything they did before had this tartan. They, the games have their own special tartan. And the background of every ad, every brochure was this tartan. And it was so busy that the first thing I did when I took over the job was I told them that we had to eliminate that background. And they were saying, well, everybody knows us from that tartan. I says, yes, we can use it, but I'm not using it as a background element. Let's put that tartan in there some other way. And I designed something so that the, the tartan was still present. People who saw it would immediately notice that that's the tartan for these Highland games. But it wasn't this big, bold background element that was really taking away from the design. So I used their past marketing material in order to implement elements of it into the new stuff that I designed. Now, question number five is, if they did have old marketing material, what did they like or dislike about their old marketing material? They're coming to you for something new. So there has to be a reason why they're not still using the old stuff. Maybe it's outdated. Maybe it's just the information on it needs to change. But if they're looking for a completely new design, they must be tired of what's old and it's always good to ask them, what is it about it that you liked or you didn't like? Maybe it was dated and there were certain pieces of it that they said it looked too something like it was designed in the 90s or even worse in the 80s. But then again, there might be something about it that they really like. And they say, well, you know, I didn't write, like the overall design, but this little piece of it I really liked. And maybe that's something you can bring forward into the new design. And that kind of brings me into question number six. And that's why are you looking for something new? And you can get some great answers from clients for that question. Now, question number seven is, do you have a company slogan? Some do, some don't. If they do, sometimes that can give you a little bit of insight into what you're going to design. Now, question number eight is, what feedback have you received on your past marketing material? Maybe the reason they want something redesigned is because their clients have been saying something about it. Maybe they didn't like it or they told them it was hard to read or they didn't like the message or, or whatever the reason or maybe it was something that a client really liked or they got a lot of good comments on something and maybe that part of it you want to bring forward. So what does their target audience think about their marketing material? Question number nine is, do you consider your brand material to be more traditional or modern? Some companies like to change things up every few years and stay modern and stay with the times where others prefer to be traditional and want to remain status quo with something that might have been established many, many years ago. Look at two of the biggest brands on the planet right now. Pepsi Cola redid their logo not too long ago in order to kind of get with the times, be more modern, where Coca-Cola has remained traditional and their logo hasn't changed very much in the past hundred years. So knowing if your client considers themselves to be more traditional or modern when it comes to their brand can really take you in a different direction when it comes to design something for them. Now, question number 10 is, is your brand associated with high-end or cost-effective products and services? If the company is producing something or offering a service and they're doing it for the masses because it's very economical, then maybe you're going to want to change your design some as opposed to a company that says we offer a higher-end product. Yes, it's more expensive than the competition, but we target a certain people and our clients like us for that. Well, that'll affect your design as well. And finally, in this section, number 11, what would you like your target audience to think of when they see your marketing material? Do they want to portray a certain emotion or bestow a certain feeling in their target audience? Is there some sort of urgency they want to build? Or are they trying to portray a feeling of trust? There's all sorts of different ways they can go with this. So it's a very valid question. 
So that's it for the questions about brand. Once again, number one, does your company use a specific color palette? Number two, are there any design elements associated with your company, such as fonts, icons, images, photos, etc.? Does your company have a mission statement? Number four, what current or past marketing material have you used? Five, what did you like or dislike about your past marketing material? Six, why are you looking for something new? Seven, do you have a company slogan? Eight, what feedback have you received on your past marketing material? Nine, do you consider your brand material to be more traditional or more modern? Ten, is your brand associated with high-end or cost-effective products and services? And number 11, what would you like your target audience to think of when they see your marketing material? Now this next section, questions about design preferences, really gets down to the nitty-gritty of dealing with your client. And question number one is, what color palettes do you prefer? Now we asked in the previous section, are there any color palettes associated with the company? So this is a little different, and it's what color palettes do you prefer? I have one client that I've been dealing with her for years and I've designed many, many, many different things for her. And I know never, ever to use the color green. No matter how appropriate it is for the design, she will not like it if I use the color green. So that's not necessarily a color palette she prefers, but I know that she likes other colors other than green, so I avoid it. There's some clients that I have that say they want to use cool colors or some clients want to use warm colors Sometimes they get very specific into what specific colors. One of the law firms I told you about told me at the beginning that they only wanted colors that could be found in nature. And when they said that, they weren't referring to the special like fluorescent colors that you can find on some insects or incandescent colors or anything like that. They meant the traditional nature colors. So finding out what color palette your client likes or dislikes is a very good question to start off with. Now, number two, is will this project be used in print, on web, etc.? If they're getting you to design something, you need to know, is this only going to be used on the web? If they're asking you to design a web banner and you're doing this from scratch with no previous marketing material, you have to know up front, are you designing this as a solely a web banner or are they going to use it in the future? Do they have plans? Maybe they don't have plans now, but it's something they might want. And that'll affect how you design something because... If you're doing something for the web, you can design something in low res. But if they decide that they like the design and that they eventually want to turn it into a billboard or use it as a vehicle wrap or or whatever the case may be, it's always good to get that sort of information up front. If they say, no, this is only going to be used for the web, we're not planning on using this anywhere else, then you can avoid all that extra work of creating high res graphics and you can stick with the lower resolution stuff for the web. Now, number three, I kind of covered in a previous section, and that's, is there anything from your past marketing materials that you want to incorporate in the new project? So I talked about design elements like fonts and icons, and if there's anything they liked or disliked from their past stuff. But this question is right down to the point. Is there anything from your past marketing material that you want to incorporate into this new project? Number four is an important question. And that's, are there any restrictions or limitations to consider when designing this project? In my area of the country, one of the limitations that I have, or sometimes the restrictions, is depending on who your client is, everything has to be in both English and French. So if a client comes to me and says, I want you to design a two-sided brochure, that's one of the questions I need to know is, are you designing a two-sided brochure because you want one side to be English, one side to be French? Or am I designing a two-sided brochure that's fully English? Because that'll really change the way I design. Do I have to squeeze everything into a certain amount of panels? Or do I have the freedom of using both sides of the brochure to do the full design? Same thing when I'm designing a website. Some clients want a full English website and a full French website for any French visitors. Where some clients, they say they deal mostly in English, so they're just going to do English. And some of them want to do an English website with only a few little things translated into French. So those are some limitations and restrictions. I don't know if you can actually call them limitations and restrictions, but that's where I'm ballparking them. But there's also other things to consider. Maybe you're designing some sort of invitation or booklet. And uh, this has happened to me before where somebody says, I want you to design an an invitation to this high end. It was a formal ball that they were putting on a charity ball and they wanted me to design this invitation. And I designed this thing and the client loved it. They, They went so far as to approve it and we were just getting ready to send it off to the printer. 
And then something came up that nobody had told me was that these invitations were being put into envelopes, but these envelopes were actually going to be delivered in these wooden boxes that the organization had purchased for this specific purpose. Well, nobody had ever mentioned that to me. And they had never thought about it in the whole design process. And it ended up that the invitations we had actually designed were too big to fit in this wooden box. So that was a limitation that I should have been told of beforehand. Now, luckily, we never sent that job to the printer. I was able to alter the design, shrink it down, find a different envelope that would get it to fit. And we were able to to produce the invitations for them. And they did deliver them in the special boxes. But that was a case where... They knew about the boxes beforehand. They just didn't put two and two together that the invitations we were doing wouldn't fit. And and I didn't know about the boxes. So maybe if I would have asked this question up front, were there any restrictions or limitations to consider? It might have jogged something in their memory and said, oh yeah, we have these boxes and they're this dimension and the invitation has to fit in there. Now question number five for design preferences, are there any new design elements you would like to try in this project? Many, many clients will look at stuff before coming to see you. If they want to design a new website, they've looked at a whole bunch of websites before. If they're designing a brochure, they've looked at brochures. It's on top of their mind. So a good question to ask them, is there any design elements that they've seen from anywhere else that they would like to incorporate in their project? Now, I'm not talking about stealing them outright or or using them exact, but if there's something that they really like, like who knows, maybe the, the one of the law firms really liked the photo of a, of a fountain pen and wanted to incorporate that into their design because they thought it really made it look classy. Well, that would be something to ask them up front. And finally, question number six is, are there any design styles that you do not like? Maybe they've seen something. If you're designing a website for somebody and they come up to you and they say, I like this, I like this. Here's a website. I do not like what they're doing here. Don't try any of this stuff. And that's good information to have. I had one client come up to me and this was an elderly lady. I think she was in her late seventies. And when I asked her, is there any design styles that you don't like? She just told me, she says, yeah, I don't like that new grunge look. (laughs) It was just funny to hear it come out of her, but I okay, I will keep that in mind. Whenever I design, I will not design anything with that grunge look. So very valid question. So those are the six questions I have about design preferences. Again, number one, what color palettes do you prefer? Number two, will this project be used in print, on web, et cetera? It could be t-shirts, billboards, maybe it's a trade show booth, who knows? Number three, is there anything from your past marketing material that you want to incorporate into this new project? Number four, are there any restrictions or limitations to consider when designing this project? Number five, Are there any new design elements you'd like to try for this project? Number six, are there any design styles that you do not like? Now, this last section is probably the hardest one to discuss with your client. And it covers everything from scale to time frame to budget. All the other stuff was fun because it was related to design and the creation process. Well, now we get into the nitty gritty behind all of that stuff. And although not very fun... It is necessary. So question number one is, do you have a budget for this project? And that's something you should ask right off the bat because you don't want to have all sorts of grand ideas. You're talking all these questions because as you're asking all the previous questions that I talked about, you're going to get some ideas in your head as you're there answering and as you're writing down answers to these things. And you should be writing down answers to these things so that you can look back at them later. But as they're giving you this, your mind is working and you're coming up with all sorts of ideas. Well, if you know that they have a budget of $500, your ideas that you come up with are going to be much different than if they come back and say they have a budget of $10,000. So even though the client might not want to discuss it too much, you have to let them know that it will affect the overall bid on the job and just what you design. Because face it, a $500 budget compared to a $10,000 budget has a wide difference in the freedom to design what you want. Now, question number two is, How many design concepts would you like to see? Because if the client comes to you and they say, we want to see three different designs, and this applies a lot to like logos and stuff like that. But I've had clients that have wanted a brochure and said, can you show me two or three different brochure designs? That's going to add on to the price. And you have to let them know that up front because sometimes if you do one design, they might love it and that's it. You don't have to move on anymore. And if they don't love it, then you create a second one But if they want you to do three up front, they have to pay for all three of them, even if the very first one you design is the one they go for. 
So a very valid question. Now, question number three, also very important, is what material will you be providing me for this project? You've asked them about previous marketing material. If there's anything they want to incorporate, are they able to give that stuff to you? Do they have the files for them? Do they have electronic copies of their logos, of the photos they use? Anything they have, they should let you know up front. Now, I'll tell you a little trick. If this is some sort of national chain, if you're dealing with, say, the local branch of a national or international company, it's sometimes so much easier to just go over somebody's head and go right to the head office to get something. I don't know how many times I've dealt with a local company and said, I need a vector version of their logo to to do something. And they keep sending me JPEGs or, or telling me, oh, just grab the logo off the website. Well, that doesn't work. And no matter how much you tell them, they'll say, well, I'll see what I can get. Sometimes it's just looking up the corporate headquarters website, asking for the marketing department and talking to somebody there who actually knows what they're talking about. And you say, listen, I'm doing this job for such and such a company in such and such a city. Can you send me a vector version of the logo? And sometimes within two, three minutes, you have it in your inbox. So that's a little trick I've learned over the years that saved me a lot of time. Now, question number four is, are there any deadlines associated with this design project? And this one's important because sometimes a deadline is not actually a deadline. A client might say, I'd like this by the end of the month. But there's a big difference with, I would like this at the end of the month. And the event this is for is happening at the end of the month. And even if that is the case, there are some times where a client will say, yes, I need this brochure for an event that's happening, say, on the 30th of the month. But if that's the case, you better follow up with saying, okay, well, when do you actually need this material? Because maybe that event isn't local and they need time to ship this somewhere. So they need it a week beforehand or they need to distribute it somehow or, or whatever the case may be. So sometimes the event might happen on a certain date, but your deadline will be much sooner. Now, question number five, this is one I ask anytime I deal with any company is who will be my primary contact person on this project? And don't take for granted that the person that you're talking to, the person that you're giving the quote and discussing this with, will be your contact person. Sometimes this is just the initial contact, but then afterwards you'll be dealing with somebody else. And I would usually stipulate up front that I need to deal with one person and one person only. Because you're just asking for trouble if you're dealing with more than one. And if anybody else tries to send you any information, I always let them know you have to send this to so-and-so first. I'm only accepting stuff from them. Now, question number six, kind of related, is who is involved with the approval process? It's one thing to say you have one primary contact, but I also like to know how many people are involved on the other end. Is my primary contact the one that can make the decisions, or does he or she have to go to the board of directors and have a dozen people sign off on this? Does it have to go through committee? That's all stuff I like to know up front. It might not change the way I'm doing the job, but I want to know that sort of thing. Because in some cases... I might ask to go present to the board. If the board is making the decision, I want to go present to the board. I don't want to present to my contact person and then have them pass this on to the board because they might not present the same way I will. And believe me, presentations are important. You can really sell your design sometimes where people might not see something until you actually explain it to them and then they see how brilliant it was. So that was question number six. Number seven, are there any third parties involved with this design project? Very important question. If there's anything involved, if there's photos, are they hiring a photographer or do they already have the photos? Are they planning on dealing with a certain printer? Are they getting something produced on a certain material? You'll want to know who these third parties are because you might want to contact them and find out if there's any limitations to what you're designing. If you're designing a sign to be on the outside of a building, you might want to talk to that sign company to find out if there's any border space or if they need a certain margin or something before you create the design. Or if you're designing artwork for the front of a t-shirt, is the company producing the t-shirt? Are they able to do a design that's 10 inches wide or does it have to be limited to 8 inches wide or whatever? So any third parties involved in the design project that you are not dealing with, you should know those up front. And question number eight related is who will be dealing with these involved third parties? So if they are hiring a photographer, do I as the designer get to talk with the photographer and tell them what sort of photos I want for my design? Or is the photographer only dealing with the company and I get whatever they give me? Now, question number nine is what services are you expecting from me? If I'm designing something and they decide they want photos and they weren't already dealing with them, Do they want me to hire a photographer on my own and just include it in the project or or bill it, add it on to the project? 
when it's stock photography, do they want something from a site that you can buy images for two, three dollars? Or do they want to go to a high end stock photography where you pay a few hundred dollars for the rights to use an image? If I'm designing something for print, do they expect me to arrange all the printing? Do they expect me to deal with the printer? Maybe the printer is going to invoice me and then I include that and they only pay one invoice. Maybe they want the printer to invoice them, but they still want me to deal with the printer. I have to incorporate that into my price. So what services are they expecting? Number 10, what do they expect from you regarding the design project? Are they expecting just the final files? If it's a logo you've designed for them, do they also want a style guide to show how to use and implement that logo? So that's another valid question. Number 10, what do you expect from me regarding this design project? It's kind of a a copy of my last question, what services, but this is more is, is what do you expect of me? Do you expect me to meet with you on a regular basis? How often do you need updates? Do you need me to go present to the board? If there's printing material, do you need me to deliver or are you able to pick up? If you want certain fonts, are you expecting me to purchase the licenses for those fonts and so forth? So what do they expect? Now, number 11 is what materials do they require at the completion of the design project? Do they just want a final PDF? Do they need the layered Photoshop files? Do they need the logo in JPEG, EPS, PNG, and all sorts of different formats? Can you just email them the stuff or do they want a flash drive or maybe burn to a DVD or or disc or something? What do they expect for you to hand over at the end of the project? And the last question, very important, and regardless of what other questions you asked before, you should be asking this, is there anything else you would like to discuss that we haven't already covered? Now, most of the time, if you've gone through this thoroughly enough, they'll say, no, we're pretty sure we've covered everything, but maybe they'll think of something that you hadn't thought of and they'll bring it up and it could be valuable, valuable information for the project. Now, I got a couple of bonus questions you can ask your client that don't really have to do with the particular project that you were discussing with them, but they could maybe help you out down the road. And three simple questions. One, are there any other design projects I can help you with? So if they're hiring you to do a brochure or they're hiring you to do a website, make sure you let them know that you have other services you can offer them and ask them if there's anything else. If they hire you to do a website, they might not know that you do brochures. So let them know, like, Do you need anything? Do you need business cards, letterheads, brochures, anything else to go along with this? Because I do it all. So make sure you let them know. Bonus question number two, ask them, is there anything I asked you about today that you need help with? Maybe one of your questions piqued their interest or curiosity when you ask them about, is there any color palette associated with your business? Well, maybe they started thinking we should have a color palette. Well, that could be something you can help them with. Say, let's sit down and discuss a color palette and I can help you with that, my experience, and I can show you what sort of colors work well together and we can develop something. And the question, of course, you should be asking every one of your clients is, do they know anyone else that can require your services? So that's it for this section. Once again, those questions. Number one, do you have a budget for this project? Number two, how many different concepts would you like to see? Three, what material will you be providing me for this project? Four, are there any deadlines associated with this project? And are they preferable deadlines or firm deadlines? Number five, who will be my primary contact for this project? Six, who is involved in the approval process? Seven, are there any third parties involved in this project? Eight, who will be dealing with the involved third parties? Nine, what services are you expecting from me? Ten, what do you expect from me regarding this design project? Eleven, What materials do you require from me at the completion of the project? And number 12, is there anything else you would like to discuss that we haven't already covered? And the final question that you should ask after going through all of this and gaining the confidence of your client is, when do you want to get started on this? Don't give them a chance. Go into it as if you know that they're going to hire you and you just want to know, when do we start? Ask it with confidence, and if they're impressed with everything you've done so far, they won't hesitate to answer. So those are my 50 questions to ask before every new design project. I know this podcast is a little bit longer than normal, but I hope you got a lot of valuable information out of this one. And if there are any other questions that you can think of that I didn't ask, I would love for you to post them in the comments on the show notes page at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 15. Now, next week's episode, which will be shorter than this one, I'm flipping things around and I'll discuss questions that your design clients should be asking you. 
So once again, I ask you, if you are enjoying this podcast, please share it with your design friends or anybody else. You can post it to your social media saying that you're listening to this podcast. I would really appreciate it. Help grow this audience, just grow this community. And while you're at it, if you have a minute, head on over to iTunes and leave me a review for the podcast. Now, don't forget this week's resource, PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro. In my opinion, it's the easiest way to alter, edit, change any PDF Now, if you want to send me anything, questions, feedback, you can use my feedback form on the website, resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback, or just email me directly at feedback at resourcefuldesigner.com. I would love for you to follow me on Twitter at resourcefuld and on my Facebook page at facebook.com slash resourcefuldesigner. Now, I know things are winding down before the holidays. I will be putting out an episode next week, but then I'm going to take a break until the new year. And I hope your design business keeps going strong right till the end of 2015. So until next time, I'm Mark DeCote reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.